Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is Sonship Establishment. We're covering what's in your notes for sessions seven and eight. There's something I want to remind you of right here at the outset. Don't, don't get lost on this. Context is everything. Where, wh- where you find a verse in your Bible, what is surrounding it, what is being talked about, the context for that is everything for years. You've heard me do this little thing. Those of you that have been with me for a while, you've heard me do this little thing about how you can pull verses out of context to prove anything. Here are three verses. Judas hanged himself. Here's another verse. Go and do thou likewise. Here's another verse. What thou doest, do quickly. Now, is that, if I just now, because they're all in the Bible, do you believe that there's a doctrine in there that we all ought to go out and hang ourselves immediately? Well, of course not. That's, that's pulling those verses out of the context they're in and putting them together in a way the Bible never meant for those to be put together. And so context is everything. Now, since Romans chapter 6, verse 1, John's question before we started this was spot on. What, what context have we been in since Romans 6, 1? Sanctification. That is the broad, that is the broad context that you have been in. So let's just make let's just make this the umbrella, the big umbrella of our context for sanctification. And you know there are three components to your sanctification. And the third one was given to you in Romans 8, 14 and 15, that you're an adopted son of your heavenly father. And you know what that's about. So now you're under a more narrow context of sonship, right? And you've been in that since verse 14. He hasn't gone anywhere else with you, but under this larger context of sanctification and in this more narrow context of you being a son, he is now beginning, first he oriented you to this, and now he's establishing your sonship before you actually begin the education itself over in Romans 12. So you're still in the sonship context. That may not sound like much, but listen, I'm, th- this is valuable for how you know to make sure that you're looking at things properly, because the verses we're going to look at today are verses that have been so mishandled for so long that most people couldn't discover the truth here if you gave them five years, uh, because they don't observe the context. I know when you know it, it becomes a very simple thing. But when you don't know it, it's devastating in its results. Okay, so that, that context of sonship, I just want you to have that in your mind. Um, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 39 com- comprises this third component uh, of our establishment as sons, and we've been dwelling on verses 28, 29, and 30. And we haven't done the details on all of it, but here it is. Let's read it together. Uh, you can follow along as I read it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, Whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, just to kind of pick up where we left off last time, when verse 28 says, all things work together for good, it is not talking about God taking all kinds of things that are happening and turning them out good for us in our life. That is not what that is talking about. Neither is that verse talking about God taking bad things and whipping them around backwards, and suddenly what we thought was a bad thing became a good thing. It has nothing to do with that. To do that is once again to abandon the context in which you find yourself. And so if you look at your note taker, that first line on your note taker, give me that next uh, deal. Verse 28 says that God will use all things as training to develop, hone, and refine our sonship skills 
for use in the creature. Now, that's my wording. I'm putting it out there that way because he is doing all of that. He is developing those skills. He is honing or sharpening those skills. He is going to refine those skills. But understand, we're talking about sonship skills that you haven't yet been introduced to. They are those skills of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity sitting over there in Romans 12 to 15, 7. Now, you're going to get there, but let me tell you that what verse 28 is talking about is he is going to take all things, good, bad, or indifferent, and he is going to use those things to train you for things you're going to face when you get out into the creature. Now, I don't know if you, just saying that, have stopped to think about that and realize the value and the wisdom behind that, but there really is something there. And so, give me this next one, Trent. Uh, God is working all things for our benefit, and that's exactly what's going on here. The main benefit of what's going on is, is not, well, let me, give me that next one, Trent. The main benefit is not for us now while we're on this earth. That's not what the good is talking about. The good is talking about in the future when we're in the heavenly places. Let me make an an illustration. Let's suppose that we're we're all going to be a baseball team, okay, or a football team or whatever you want, When we go out and practice, that practice is for your benefit on game day. If if you just go out there without have ever run the play, you you won't you'll just get trampled. You won't know what to do. This is what this life is about. This is why he didn't take you off the earth as soon as you got saved and just translate you into the heavenly places. Because now you're going to be trained. And that means you're going to get it wrong sometimes and you're going to get it right sometimes, but you're going to to learn to look and you're going to see the nuances of how these skills get used. You're going to be able to put them together and, and to do some wonderful things. And you're going to, this is practice right here. So when practice is over, you get in the heavenly place, it's not practice anymore, then it's the real thing. And that's what you're being trained for. That's how all things are working together for good. They are the train. And you do realize when it says all things, it means every good thing that happens is training you. Every bad thing that happens, it's training you. Things that aren't necessarily good or bad, those are training you too. Do you realize the wisdom in this? you would be able to get up in the morning and say, literally, once you've got these sonship skills, there is absolutely nothing that will happen today that is not going to benefit me later. Wow, how good is that? Because you know what the big beef everybody has with an education? I mean, you're sitting in geometry class, and one day you look over at your buddy and you go, when are we ever going to use this? Right? And if you don't ever think you're going to use it, are you really motivated to pour yourself into it? Here's what your father is saying. Every single thing that happens to you is going to work, is able to be worked for your benefit. Wow. Now, that's, a, that's an incredible thing. You know what? That's going to make every day an adventure. <laughs> now, right now, you may be looking at it and saying, how in the world is this going to work for good for me? But once you get the sonship skills, you'll be presented with opportunities with everything that takes place. So instead of looking at, you, you, do you see how this is going to change your thinking? While everybody else is going, oh man, we were planning on doing this and now it's raining. Well, you'd be glad for the rain right now, but I mean, one day you'll say that. And, and while everybody else is moaning and complaining, you know what you're going to be thinking? you know what? This is how this is training me. This is what I'm benefiting for. This is the good that's being worked. It's not good that it rained you out. That never, 
But that's not what your father was after. He was after something much bigger than that. Okay. Um, So here's the next point. This good is only achieved by those who are participating in the sonship education. Do you know why? They're the only ones that will have the skills. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) it's almost like saying the only people allowed on the field are members of the team. I mean, no one's trying to be elitist about that. That's just the way it works. So that's the way this works too. So when you see verse 28, I know what the old default to that is, but that's not the old, the old way of, well, God's going to work it all out for good somehow when we're looking for that to happen right now. See, in our life, that has nothing to do with that whatsoever. All of this, just like verses 26 and 27, talking about the arrangement that he has made because of those infirmities you had in sonship prayer is something that's sitting off in the future. So when you get there, you don't get rattled by that, but you know the Spirit makes intercession for you. And it's just like you were asking the Father yourself, and He answers that prayer, and that education can go right on unhindered. Well, this is for something that's still sitting off in the future for you too. And so as you look at that, just be thinking, because right now what you're tempted to do is you're going to say, okay, I'm going to see everything as a learning experience. But you really can't do that right now. But He's telling you about it now because you are literally right around the corner from starting this education. And when you do, He already wants it planted in your mind that everything you're beginning to learn is going to be able to be utilized with everything that happens to you to train you for the future. Everybody got that? Okay. Now, um, so with that in mind, let's give this next one. The real application of this verse will be taken place once you have begun the education proper. And when I say the education proper, I don't mean that you're not being educated in something now, but it's not the education of those four sonship decision-making skills that are really going to teach you to think and, and, and conduct yourself like your heavenly Father and qualify you to labor with Him. Okay, uh, now there's another point that I want to make about this, and that is Romans 8.28 is not primarily meant to be a verse that brings comfort to you when something bad takes place. How do you know that's true? I mean, supposing that I got this right, how, do you know, how would I know? What would make me think that? Well, first of all, because Romans 8.28 doesn't say, and we know that all the bad things work together for good. It's not focusing on bad things. But you were told about suffering somewhere else and how you were supposed to have patient endurance, weren't you? That's the part that brings you comfort when something bad takes place. That, we've already covered that. Now, God hasn't said everything to you about that issue that is going to be said, but He's already introduced it to you, and you've already seen it. He's not repeating that lesson here. Now, I do, before I make my next point, I do want to make it clear. Yes, it is somewhat of a comfort to know that even something bad God is going to utilize for good, but, you, but that's not the way people really see that. The way people really see this verse is God is going to take something bad and turn it all around so that it's no longer a bad thing. God doesn't have to change it from being a bad thing to use it. In fact, you'll learn things from the bad things you could never learn from when it all turned out without a problem. So, um, so this is really all working for your benefit in that way. So if it's not meant to bring us comfort, what in the world is it meant to do? Well, here it is. The primary issue is to inform us as to the means of our training and gaining practical experience, not to focus on the bad things of life. This verse isn't focusing on that. It's telling us the way that our Heavenly Father is going to to train us. And if you see it, anything as as more than that, you're really 
moving off track from what this verse is intended to do and produce in your thinking. Now, again, if you ever listen, if you go get a commentary and look up Romans 8.28 or listen to someone's sermon on Romans 8.28, I can almost guarantee you that this is not what you'll hear because it will be taken out of the sonship context. And, and they don't mean to do that. I'm not saying it's being done maliciously. I'm just saying if you don't know about sonship, you can't recognize this context. And then this verse is going to be lost to you. But you know what? Someone will come along and say, and by the way, I would not suggest that you go out and talk to anybody about your new understanding of Romans 8, 28. That will be an exercise in frustration. And, and, and what will happen is you'll be viewed as a kook, and, and they'll say, don't tell me because I've claimed Romans 8, 28 over and over, and, and I know that God has taken a bad thing and helped me out with it. Well, I'm not denying that seeing Romans 8, 28 that way doesn't have a placebo effect. I'm not denying that. If you think God is helping you, that makes you feel better about whatever it is. And at the end, you'll say it like this, and God got me through it. That's how you'll do it. And, 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 and I'm, I'm not saying that we don't give God glory, but what I'm saying is, that is not at all what Romans 8.28 has in mind. By the way, some people, when they go to the doctor, they do get a placebo. They get a sugar pill because he knows there's not really anything going on here except up here. But when they get that pill and he says, are you doing better? And they go, yeah, I feel lots better. You know what that really goes on in clinical trials? where nobody knows who's getting the real thing and who's getting the nothing pill. I guarantee you there's people on both sides of that trial that are going, I'm feeling better. I'm doing better. I don't hurt near as much. Because there's something about, it. well, I could overdo it. Have you ever just really felt bad and gone to the doctor and felt better while you were in the waiting room before you went in? You know, and you go like, what am I doing here? But you know, as soon as you go back home, you're going to be in the depths of misery and pain again, right? But there's something about knowing or believing that you're going to get that help that actually does help. But this is not talking about that. What you're talking about is an issue that you're supposed to deal with back up further in Romans 8, the patient endurance. Okay. Now, with that out of the way, um, let's see. Um, let's, go, let's go to this next thing, Romans 8, 28. And I want to show you a, a particular, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, give, give me that back. Okay, the comfort should be found in the fact of our being trained, prepared, and experienced in, a, in an apprenticeship-type way before we actually begin to labor with our Father in the heavenly places. And that's kind of what I was referring to a while ago about the wisdom and genius of God in doing this. Can you imagine... If someone was going to say to you, there's a very complex procedure that I want you to perform as a job, and we're going to walk you over to the machine and leave you with it. Now, that would be a little bit frightening right from the get-go. Can you remember the first time you sat down at a computer? Do you remember how out of your depth you felt? And, and I, I, can, I can remember having trouble with my computer and I was with Bob Butler, and he took his computer in to get some guy to fix it, and I was just telling him about my problem, and I mean, this was in the very beginning stages. I knew nothing. I didn't have the vocabulary down or anything, and, and I said, what do you think is causing that? And he went, oh, it's your peripherals. And I thought, what? What is that? I had no idea what he was talking about. From the looks on your faces, about half of you do not know what he was talking about, even now. He said, you're for vision. <laughs> yeah, your peripheral vision, right? Uh, he, w when he said that, I thought he was putting me off. He just didn't want to give me an answer. So he was giving it to me in trade terms that he knew I wouldn't understand, you know, and I just thought that was what was happening. Very, a very uncomfortable and unfamiliar area for me back then. Well, what I want to say to you is 
do you notice the genius that there is a comfort that verse 28 gives you, but here's what that comfort is in, in that you're going to be trained, prepared, and experienced in a, if I can say it this way, hands-on way before you're ever called on to labor with your father. Now, isn't that great? See, I'm trying to remove, if there's any comfort in Romans 8, 28, if you really understand the verse, there's the comfort. And knowing he's not just going to throw you out in the creature and go, when I get back, this had better be done. You know, <laughs> but, 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 but Lord, <laughs> when I get back, the bonds of corruption better have been reversed. Well, well, what? Can you imagine? But you're going you're gonna to be equipped. There's the comfort in Romans 8, 28. Okay, now, having said that, let's go to Romans 8, 28 and look at something else. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, just read that far because the word I'm really after here is together. And when I was first studying through this, I was wondering, is this together a reference just to the all things or is it really referring to all things together with something else. And that's really the right way to do it. It's not, and I know there's nothing else mentioned in the verse, but there is something that you ought to be so aware of that he doesn't have to put it in the verse. All he has to do is say it just this way and you know. There is something that without it, those things that are happening to you won't prepare you at all for the future. Does anybody know what that thing is? It's the sonship education. If you don't have the education, what, what are you fixing to be educated in? Those four sonship skills. If you don't, look, if you don't have that, you know all you're having happen to you? All things. <laughs> See, if it was just the all things, if that's all it was, guess what? Everybody would be being prepared for the future. But without the education, folks, the only thing that's happened to you is a bunch of good stuff and a bunch of bad stuff and a bunch of stuff that's neither good nor bad. Those things alone cannot do what this verse is saying it will do. They're not producing that good. They're not working. So all things work together for good, but only within the framework of the sonship education. Okay, now you can look at that, and I've said some more things about it in the notes, but here it is in the, in the PowerPoint and, and on your note taker. All things are going to work together with our sonship education in order to get this training accomplished. Doesn't that make sense? Of course. Okay, so um, that's how they work for our good and work for our benefit. And that benefit is that we're going to be given experience that we can look at a situation and we're going to have the skills that even though we may not have looked at this exact situation before, we can use what we know to figure out exactly what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and, and I think, most importantly, why that needs to be done. And, um, and, and that's what's going to be happening there. Okay, <clears throat> um, let's see. Verse 28. Here's, give me, let me do this next. For, here we are. And we know that all things work together for good, and now we come to those two qualifying phrases. To them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, we're going to look at these phrases one by one, and I know the way they have normally gotten looked at. Someone says to themselves when they read Romans 8, 28, I have real affection for the Lord, so I love God. Check off number one. That's for me. And the way they read the other one, to them who are the called according to his purpose, well, I got saved, and that's what that's talking about. And so check off number two, Romans 8, 28 is for me. Because I have all kinds of good feelings about God, and I'm saved. 
That's what they think those are referring to. But see, you haven't been in a context talking about being saved. You're in a context talking about your sanctification. You've been there for three chapters. And so once again, context comes into play. But what I do want to do is I want us to take these two phrases one by one, and I want you to understand them in the context in which we find them. That's the only way that we're going to get these right. So um, let's see. The first one, yeah, okay, there it is highlighted. To them that love God. Now, <clears throat> this, uh, as, you know, as I was saying to you just then, this is not talking about you having an affection for the Lord. Of course you do. And why would you say most people love the Lord? If you ask Christians, do you love the Lord, most of them are certainly going to say yes. And if you say why, what, would be the, what do you think would be the overwhelming answer as to why they love the Lord? All right, because he saved me, right? I got saved from my sin. I'm not going to hell in the lake of fire. I'm, you know, he redeemed me, and I was unworthy, and he did it anyway. But again, now that you're right, your answer is right. That's the answer you would hear most often because that's as far as most saved people's thinking goes. I got saved. That's all it was about, and now it's, I've settled that issue, and now it's over and kind of do my own thing here. But you're in sanctification. So in the broad context of sanctification, and then the more narrow context of sonship, this love, ha well, I think I've got a PowerPoint on it, don't it? The love that's being rever referred to in verse 28 is not referring to a general love for God generally people love God, and it's just because He saved them. It would be very appropriate to call this sonship love. In other words, you love Him. Of course you love Him because He saved you, but the love that He's talking about here goes beyond that. Those that love God here are sons who understand what He has done for them by adopting them, and they want that, and they want to be instructed by their father, and they have a desire to get his wisdom, and it thrills them to think that they're going to go up into the heavenly places and labor with him. Yeah. It, it's a big deal to them. Yes, yes, yes. That's a son that loves his father as a son. Now, they're all sons, but they don't all love from the standpoint of a son. They love from the standpoint of a child. That's where they're coming from. Your father, is, he's been talking to you about being his son. He's been talking to you about where you're going to work with him and the creature. He's been talking to you about all this issue of your sonship. And now when he says, to them that love God, he's talking about from that perspective as a son. And now let's take a look at the, uh, the second of these, and that is to them who are the called according to his purpose. Um, by the way, I, just wanna, I, just, I do want to say, there's not anything, when someone says, well, I love the Lord because he saved me, there's not anything wrong with that. It's just not what Romans 8.28 has in view. That's all I'm trying to establish in that. Now, in this last phrase, there are two words that throw everybody off, and that is the words called and the word purpose. This is where every preacher that went to school now immediately jumps the rails out of the father-son relationship and goes off into God's eternal divine decrees. That's what that, and that's what you, they've been taught to do. And, and, and depending on your theology will determine what those divine decrees are all about. But this is, this is not about divine decrees. This is not. You say, well, Brother Mike, that's your opinion. No, it's the Bible's opinion. Easy for me to say that, but can I just show you one word and prove it? He's not talking about divine decrees because he says, 
to them. And that's a people, not a, not a list of decrees. And by the way, all through here, give me the next verse. It's a, it's a, no, I'll back up. No, I'll back up. Don't give me that yet. 29 and 30, if you just look in there, it says, for whom he did foreknow, them he also predestined. Again, he's talking about people. That's the focus of this. Talking about someone, not something. That's my point. This is not about the decrees. I'm not saying God can't decree something. What I'm trying to do is keep us on point with the terminology that's being used in this passage. And really, the more you get out of the context, the more complicated this gets. What you're about to see is this is really very, very simple. For whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And, and whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And we're going to see those terms in a minute together in a list. But what I'm going to tell you now is, in this context, there is absolutely nothing in that list that can only be done by an omnipotent God. It gets done by fathers to their own children all the time. Now, you know what your problem is in seeing that? You standardized how a word gets used. You saw it, and you started thinking about it. It's only defined one way in your Bible, didn't you? And so that gave you a problem. How many times have we seen God use the same word in different ways? He is not talking about the things that you first think of because you know what you did when you saw all of that? You defaulted back to salvation again. He's talking, listen, he's talking to saved people. <laughs> if, he, if you're not saved, he's spinning his wheels talking to you about sanctification. So <clears throat> we're going to look at these terms and you're going to see they really are simple. And I'm going to make them simple so that, look, if I can understand them, everybody in this room can get it. This is going to be made easy, and it's supposed to be. And the only way it's going to get complicated is for us to get out of this context and now run off and go into some deep theological study of something that God foreordained back at whatever and, and get off into that. And, you're, and if you do that, it is going to get complicated. So we're going we're gonna to keep it from being that. All right, so give me that next. Okay, the called according to his purpose is simply describing who we are as sons who are engaged in the sonship education. That's what that phrase is doing at its core. As an adopted son of your heavenly father, you are called according to his purpose. Now, I was talking about these two words giving us problems. And when it comes to, by the way, when you talk about called, you're called according to his purpose. Well, let, let me, I think this is the point in which I get it. So, um, no, I get those questions back over here. So, I'll, I'll wait before I jump over to that. When you think about the word purpose, um, I don't, what's, the, what's the, if the next slide is not a verse, don't put it up, Trent, but if it is, yeah, okay, here we are. When you see this verse, I've already given you the answer I was going to ask. I forgot I'd highlighted it. There's a word here that makes this different from the way you would normally think when you read this verse because we're not looking at the words carefully. And we know that all things work together for good. There's the statement, the first qualifier, to them that love God. And we know that's a particular kind of love that a son has for his father in the father-son relationship. To them who are, that's a state of being. Now you are something. 
He didn't say to the called. Let me ask you a question. How many people who trusted Jesus Christ to be their Savior, how many of them are made to be sons? All of them. How many of them are adopted? All of them. And guess how many of them are being called to His purpose? No, 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 think. They're all going to be called. But just because you're called, does that mean you respond to the call? No. Yeah, it was, it was kind, of, kind of a trick question. This is talking to those who are. And notice it didn't just say who are called. They are the called. In other words, they are in a state of being in which they have responded to the call to be according to his purpose. Tommy was going to fill in the blank for me. I'm, and he's right because, look, here's what I haven't told you about this. What is his purpose? There is a purpose. By the way, before you can say, well, I'm called according to his purpose, don't you not have to know what the purpose is? Sure. So what, what is the purpose? Oh, okay, okay. Simplify it. Okay, wait, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Raise your hand. I can't do it. There's too many. Okay, to labor with him. Well, you said it. You did. I wanted you to simplify it a little. Did you say labor? You did. Okay. Well, Ron said, you know, go up the creature and do this. And he started giving me a list of things to do. And I thought, all those are right. But just to boil it down into a nutshell, he sounded like me, you know, like more than he had to give. The, the, the nutshell is he wants us to labor with him. Oh, look, let me back up from that. Could he have run this thing by himself? Sure. <laughs> well, of course. But you know what? He said, I've got a purpose. You know what you're thinking? If you're me, he could have run it better, right? <laughs> he could have gone, man, there'd be a, this is a lot of trouble. You know what? Y'all just forget it. I'm going to run it. But he doesn't. He says, I want you. I want this intima intimacy of relationship of Father, son, father, daughter, I'm going to put what's in my heart, I'm going to write it on your heart. I'm going to put my wisdom instilled into you, and you're going to learn to think like me and conduct yourself like me, and I'm going to put you out there, and you're going to run my creature, and I'm not going to look over your shoulder. Man, that's good stuff. That's his purpose. God has a business. It has two great purpose aspects. One concerns this earth and the nation of Israel. The other one concerns the heavenly places and the body of Christ. And all of that is His business. So He has a purpose down here and He has a purpose out there and you have been called according to that purpose. Now, when he says, now knowing, now, now knowing what the purpose is, and I mean, well, first of all, let me say this. Is that unclear for anybody? D does that not make real, Amen. I want to say perfect sense? Perfect. D d I mean, doesn't it? Yes. You, when you sit, Tommy? That's why we have glorified bodies. And that is That's exactly right. E everything that he has determined for us is in accordance with his purpose. purpose. I mean, it just... It just fits like a hand in a glove. You know what the amazing thing about this is? Once you see it, all these things in your Bible suddenly start just falling right into place. It's like pieces of a puzzle just coming together. It's just wonderful. Okay, but to get this back on track, <coughs> when he says, to them who are the called, see, if he just meant everybody, he would have said this. And we know all things work together for good to them that he could just generally mean love God to them who are called. Or to them that love God, uh, to the called according to his purpose. He could have said that. And that would have meant everybody to the called because everybody gets called. Now, this kind of answers a question. I was explaining sonship 
to some folks one one evening, and one of the people I was talking to said, well, maybe God doesn't want everybody to labor with him. Maybe he wants some of us to say no to the sonship education. And I thought, what wisdom are you going to be left with if you don't have your father's? <laughs> you really think that's his will? What? <sighs> I can just think of a hundred things that are wrong with that. But she was thinking at it from an earthly standpoint in which, well, not everybody wants to do what their parents do. And I'm thinking, if you don't want to participate in your Heavenly Father's business, you have a heart problem. Uh, that's my own opinion of it. And I think it's the Bible's opinion of it. You do, you, look, we went through this back when, what I got left here, well, back when um, um, uh, Samuel was told to go to uh, uh, Jesse and say, you know what, you're going to anoint one of his sons to be king. And remember, Eliab was the oldest, and he was the most stately and the most... In fact, he looked so much and held himself so much like a king that Samuel says to the Lord, surely the anointed of the Lord stands before us. And God said, keep going. <laughs> and that had to be a shock to not only Eliab and to Jesse and to Samuel, but to the other brothers as well, because they're probably thinking, oh, buddy, if it ain't him... Which one of us is it? Because, hey, everybody thought this guy was a shoe-in, and he goes all through them, and by the time God says no to all of them, Samuel has to ask the question, do you have any others? And he goes, well, I got one out keeping the sheep. He said, well, bring him in. And you know, the, because what God was looking for wasn't the smartest or the brightest or the most articulate or the most popular or the most stately or the best communicator. He was looking for a man after his own heart. Amen. And that's why I say, if you don't want your father's business, you have a heart problem. Yeah. What a word. So that's why David got it. Because whatever he learned in this word, he said, well, he wasn't the smartest. It doesn't matter. He's going to get his father's wisdom. And that's going to outstrip anything anybody else had. God's not worried about that. He's going to fix that part, right? All right. Well, anyway, the, part, the point I'm trying to make here is now this qualifier is you are in a state of being the called according to his purpose. That means you're actively a part of that. Do you see? Because isn't that, uh, otherwise, isn't that a strange construction to them who are the called? I mean, that you could leave any of those words out and still get a different meaning. Those who are called or to them uh, or, or to the called, according. I mean, you can leave stuff out all over. But when he does it this way, he's not just trying to be verbose or wordy about it. He's trying to, to show you that this is a particular kind of love and this is a people who find themselves in a particular kind of situation and that they are being, they are being according to that purpose in response to that calling. Now, here's my next question. So if the purpose is that we're going to labor with him, what do you suppose the calling is to? Oh, yes. Yes. Tommy says sonship, and you said the education, and we want to put them together because they're both right. You're being called to the sonship education. How many believers are called to that education? Listen, that, that's sitting in the Scripture, isn't it? It's sitting in there. Anybody that can see that can see. The, it's, the sa it's written the same for everybody. So the calling is to the education. So you're called to the sonship education for the purpose of what? There you go. Do you see how easy that is? I mean, you don't need to run off into divine decrees and 
thing. Oh, God had a purpose and he made a, you know, you don't need to go do that. This verse is perfectly clear right where it is here. <coughs> okay. By the way, I just want to say this as we get cl close to the end of our first session. I, I, I almost decided not to say this to you. But what follows verse 28? Is there a verse that follows this, Trent? Does t if 29 follows this on the PowerPoint, let me have it. If not, just leave, leave it where it is. Yeah, yeah. It, it says, a call according to his purpose. For Here's the next. Now there's the next phrase. That starts in verse 29. Do you see anything in verse 28? Oh, oh no, let me, let, me, let me do it differently. There, this, there's a way that this has been put. I really like it. You should be able to, as you read your Bible, just put your hand over everything except the verse that you're looking at. And when you get down to the bottom of your hand, you should be able to look at what you've read, and it should make sense, you know, up to that point. You may get further explanation in that next verse as you pull your hand down. You may get some further explanation, but you understand as you do that, when you got to the end of verse 28, if we put our hand at the end of verse 28 and we didn't know what was next, there's something sitting in this verse that does let you know. You might not have said it in these exact words, but what he means by this, you would look at 28, and if you were just thinking about it without reading the next verse, you would say, he's got to say something about this. And then you'd pull your hand down, and the first phrase you would read would be, for whom he did foreknow. And you would be going, that's exactly what I was talking about. I didn't say it quite that way, but that's exactly what I was talking about. You kind of would anticipate that a little bit. Can you look at verse 28 and tell me what it is that would give you that clue? Knowing, by the way, well, you do know what this is now, but just act like you don't. Is there anything here? By the way, this is highlighted for another reason, but. Well, okay, the, the them is the qualifiers, right? Okay, to them that love God, he's making a, a qualify, he's qualifying now because not everyone Verse 28 isn't written with everyone in mind. By the way, let me say it like this. this is, I'm glad you brought that up. Why does God say, is this about sons? Is it? It is. Then why doesn't the word sons even appear in the verse? Well, it is a given. It's about sons, but there's another reason. There's another reason sons doesn't appear in this verse. Oh, okay, okay, hold that. That's, that's good. What'd you say? Well, only sons are called. That's true, but how many sons are called? Aww. All of them. Okay, there's something. It is from the Father's perspective. That's true, and we're going to enlarge on that in just a little bit. But there's something else God is doing. Tommy? Well, he starts the verse in saying, we know, and then this next verse is, he did foreknow. I think there's a relationship between when we know and foreknow because the foreknowledge is that we know something about these things working together. God knows that when they do, certain things are going to take place. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Okay. You're looking at that. That's good. That's good. It's not right. Well, well, it's not exactly where I'm headed. Hey, look, let me be the first to say just because of what we're covering here doesn't mean there aren't other things you can look at and see in there. There are. Because obviously, you know, we're not being exhaustive. I know you think we are, but we're not. We're just moving slow. There's a difference. Uh, but 
when he said, but w- w- let me get back to that question because I kind of interrupted what you were trying to answer. Why doesn't he use the word sons in this verse? Because God, by saying this the way he has, is distinguishing between sons and sons. Now, in what way? This is the last thing I'll be able to say before we come back to this. Some sons, they are sons, they are adopted, are going to be unusable in the creature. That is not the group he has in mind. He is talking about sons who are involved in the sonship education. See, are they both sons? So you can't use that word because now you're talking about everybody. So what he does is he words it in a way to distinguish distinguish a set of sons among sons. That make sense? Isn't that wise? Man, God is good. But people, I know people look at it and they go like, why does he say it's so funny? He has a purpose behind all of that. You know, he, and that's what he's doing here. He's drawing your thinking out so that you understand the call may be for everyone, but not everyone is being the called according to that purpose. They're not all doing it. Okay, now, <clears throat> I kind of used my time up there. So we'll come back. We'll answer that now. The question that we, you've probably forgotten the question now. We'll come back and reissue the question at the start of the next session, and we'll talk about that. But there is, a, there is something sitting in this verse that kind of clues you in about what he's going to talk about next. Or at least you know it's got to come up really soon. I mean, I'm not saying you know it's the next words out of his mouth, but it's going to, he's going to have to say something about it. And, and the only reason you'll miss it is because you're going to overthink it. It's very simple. It's very basic. So much so that when I say it to you, you'll go like, oh, well, we all knew that. You know, be like the insurance commercial. Well, everybody knows that. But I want you to see it because I want you to begin looking at when he makes a statement like this, it's supposed to lead your thinking somewhere. So when he makes this next statement, instead of now running off and going, Oh, in the foreknowledge of God. He, look, that's not what's going on. He's already set the stage for this word by something that he has told you back here. All right, take a break and we'll come back and talk about it. Exactly.